recording it. All right. I am so delighted and grateful and honored to be uh, <laughs> part of this conversation and I have two guests on the Fabrice Garia show, uh, Judith Goldstein and Caroline James. Um, without further ado, let's dive right in. How How would you say that your background has shaped your understanding of power as an idea, as a concept, as a structure? Well, it depends upon, to some extent, what parts of the background one wants to dive into. Mm -hmm. So the concept of power when you're a child is a very different concept of power when you are an adult. And when you're an adult, when you're in a marriage or a relationship, and, 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 and when you have children, and when you have a career, and when you have, um, in my particular case, a, a, an, an organization to to lead and to um, and try to make effective. So I think that one goes back and forth between wanting to have power uh, and feeling powerless or not powerful enough to achieve what you want uh, and all sorts of emotions attend the feeling of having power and then the feeling of losing power or also when you're a child what do you know about power hmm. your parents have power or your friends have power over you but you don't know what your power is you know what your will is what you want but what does that mean in terms of, of actual power so I don't think I don't think I ever really thought about power when I was when I was growing up. Um, and I think that I probably, to the extent I thought about it, I probably tried to have some power through the power of others. Mm. Um, and sometimes you make good choices in terms of whom you empower to have the power that you want. And sometimes you make bad choices. And sometimes it's not a question of choice. It's a question of what is thrust upon you. For example, your parents, they have the power uh, as you're growing up and uh, power in so many different ways. And sometimes that power is exercised well, and sometimes it's exercised very poorly and and in a very um, uh, a punitive way. And then another part of the question of power is, how do you respond to feeling powerless? And that takes a lot of energy. It may take more energy than thinking about power. You may, you may, in fact, focus more and get immersed in what it means not to have power, to feel impotent, to feel that you have no control, that you feel you don't know how to exert control. And that's um, something that one can get deeply tied up in, sometimes with some good tools to work with and sometimes you don't know how to do it, how to deal with it, what to do. And that's particularly true, I think, as a child, if you grow up in a family where power is not exercised responsibly hmm. and power is essentially imposed punitively, which deeply affects the capacity to grow. And to, and to imagine what a future could be. Mm. So, uh, I don't know. Caroline, <laughs> my dear. 
brought up in terms of like thinking about power in the childhood is such an interesting place. I think to even start that conversation because when I think about like my earliest relationship with power, I'm, I really already know I grew up in a very abusive home. And so in that dynamic, the, the power was, it was patriarchal power, it belonged to my father exclusively, and there was no dialogue around that. But then when I went into foster care, what I began to learn was this idea of, of being powerless because I am a child, and so, and there are no such things as children's rights, really, there are not. Um, but also recognizing that if I did not in some way learn to, to take some sort of control and shape this dynamic, then the whole system was going to consume me. Mm-hmm. And so what I learned about power in that circumstance was that power was to be educated, to be knowledgeable, to have some awareness, to be able to articulate something back. And it, it, it's an interesting thing because in that dynamic, what you're dealing with is a system that has rules, it has processes, it has protocols, right? And if you understand them, then there's a sense of power that you get from being able to negotiate that. And we see that same dynamic played out in our larger society. If you know the law, you can negotiate these dynamics and have some power over it. Um, but then when you when you introduce these larger dynamics of inequalities and injustices, then it presents another layer of what it means to have power. Because you have to hold in both hands this, this knowledge that you can have, you can have the knowledge, you can have the awareness, you can have the idea, you can be right, but still not be powerful enough to make the shift that you're looking for. That there is a a negotiation that's always occurring. Yeah, I really, really like both of you where you're coming it from, from growing up in a society, the idea of like using one's power to empower others, the idea of power being sort of taken away from you by other structures, the idea of feeling powered and embodied power. So it's like there's like a, different versions of power. And I appreciate what you both have said, because I think for me, like growing up in Haiti, a, a lot of my early conception of power came from my understanding of history. I think history, like their history was like, I could not remove myself from history. It's like, oh, it's almost as if history had sort of given me a template to live and dance and exist and become. And it's like, and I had a duty, not only to my ancestors, but also to the becoming of a, a, a bigger society. And like you're saying, uh, Caroline, that there are, different parts and places that are kind of moving and and engaging and have different levers so i guess the the next the question would be like and i know judith you've studied a lot around and engaged around like the history of the holocaust and and i know caroline as well you're, you're like steeped in the social justice world like like how how has those that historical piece informed how you navigate not only your own power but also spaces like throughout your day or throughout your life or throughout organizations like how how has that kind of raised your awareness of like your own power but also navigating a society where there is a lot of injustices um Okay, so from my perspective, the 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 answer is is quite uh, I think quite complicated. Uh, so I grew up in a middle class Jewish family. The most powerful person in the family in the in the home was a woman who took care of the children a black woman who came from the South and who ran this house and ran and essentially um, made such a powerful a powerful impression on us, uh, particularly on me, um, that that in the larger sense in the society, she had almost no power. Uh, in fact, because of uh, circumstances in the South, she had to to leave North Carolina and come and take a domestic job in in New York, and she had to leave her child in, with her family. Um, 
so and then she had to work six days a week um, and essentially full time for I don't even know where there was a reasonable salary I didn't know as a as a child um so she was a, a powerless in some respects but within the that particular family she had all the power over to hold the family together which was a difficult family and to um try to make sure that we grew up well despite the, the difficulties um within the family um in in the broader context it was as i mentioned a middle class jewish family and it was um, you know th there was some economic stability but it was also within the context of the holocaust and of the ever present sense of of uh, overwhelming catastrophe for um for for jews for european jews and in the community i grew up in there were a number of immig jewish immigrants who had escaped war everybody i knew uh had relatives who uh who had died in the holocaust there wasn't there wasn't a jew who was un, unaffected by this and it dominated uh the sense of of the precariousness of of life the precariousness of of being jewish at the same time in the late 40s that you have the creation of the state of israel and so there's a sense of renewal and empowerment even though um the state is at war and it's weak and all the rest of it but there's this sense of of future empowerment and in those years uh, the mobility of american society that mobility was exclusively white mobility and uh and increasing wealth coming out of the second world war uh and so it was a period of of the um, sense of for these immigrant jews of belonging of being able to uh, uh achieve some financial stability since they were literally a generation away from poverty uh but the 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 um the transformation was stunning because of american power because of the american consumer and because of the fact that whites controlled uh economic educational uh you know social cultural uh the foundations of american society so it was built I, 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 what i really want to say is that the, the power that the middle class jews felt which is the group i grew into that power was dependent upon others not having power yeah. though this woman had the power in the house and she guarded it and we knew it um but it was basically while we were making our way it was on the backs of others and not not that one knew it but i mean what you were you were conscious of but you weren't conscious of it so th this dynamic of, of power and powerlessness um you could see it you could feel it and for those who were going to benefit from the opportunities there was the sense of increased power and for those who weren't uh there was pain and deprivation um and in the community that i grew up in um almost all of the domestic help the maids were were black um they lived in the homes uh, for you know six days a week and then they would have every other sunday off every thursday off every other sunday off um 
And those who didn't live in white homes lived in uh, in segregated areas. Uh, we had a wonderful woman who lived in a house that had no plumbing. I mean, we knew it. Uh, it was it was horrible, but th that uh, that sense of immense deprivation and um, and privilege uh, it was very very great. Um, so the sense of of caring or thinking about how to improve the society, so it's injustices and it's imbalance, it's punitive uh, aspects can be uh, could be lessened. That was something I was aware of, but again, in 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 a, um, in a, in a it's, this isn't the quite word, but but the the sense of 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 annihilation of a people and the loss of of relatives in in Eastern Europe. Um, the sense that disaster had really uh, come to, uh, to 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 Jews was a different sense of the sense of disaster coming to the American black population. It was an ongoing disaster. It was an ongoing. Um, a sense of power versus impotence and justice versus injustice and aspiration versus feeling that there was no future. I, I would I thank you so much, Judith. I would love to, uh, with the with the word future, I would love to hear Caroline, your response or your thoughts around the question. Um, and then I have some thoughts after as well. Yeah. Um, when when Judy Judy when you were talking, what it brought me to was this kind of question. I'm thinking about the time period that you're describing, and I'm thinking about where are my people during that time period, right? And you're locating them. Um, and I think that there's something fascinating about if I think about history, right? The learning of history. And if I think about what that has to do with my my sense of power, or my or my growing sense of power when I um, growing up and throughout my life, I think that the way that I understood, and it is of course not by mistake, but the way that I understood the power that we had as Black people was that we had used our power irresponsibly. Right. That was the larger kind of, and that and it remains the larger kind of narrative. Well, Black is this idea of irresponsible use of power. You could have you could have done this. If you wanted to go to school, you would have gone to school. If you wanted to get on off of drugs, you would have you would have gotten off of drugs. So growing up in in the crack epidemic, being what it was, and the narrative of the crack crack epidemic, um, largely up until late, when we've seen some of this research come out to show us all the ways in which our larger systems have supported that epidemic going on. The way that I always thought about it and the way that it was always pitched was that there was something that we had to fix in order for us to be worthy of a position of power. And I think that when I, you know, coming from poverty, coming from those circumstances, the narrative was very much that if I if I got the education, it was going to fix the problem. It was going to put me in a position where I would be able to have the kind of power that was bestowed upon other people because they had done the work for that, right? And I think that that's an interesting, um, it's an interesting dynamic to grow up under. Um, and it is an interesting dynamic to develop your sense of power. Because naturally in that sense of power, what you're thinking is that there's a way in which you're going to prepare yourself to be able to negotiate power with, with the system, to enter into the system. You're going to be prepared to enter into this and to, to enter into it in a way in which you can affect change, in which you can do something that's going to shift it. And that's very much the way that I thought about it for quite some time until I learned more and more about the system and, and how we ended up in these positions that we're in. And I think the crack, crack epidemic is a beautiful kind of like microcosm of what that meant. Because in that moment, 
what we're talking, even when we're talking about the crack epidemic, it was more from the perspective of the failure of this entire population and not necessarily what we're talking about now when we talk about the opioid epidemic, which is this idea that you've got a full body addiction, the idea that we need to bring out all of our, uh, our repertoire of, of money and, and finances and support and health and aid to, to support those communities. And so I think my relationship with power was very much one, it was influenced by a misunderstanding of history. It was influenced by a misreading of what it meant, what, what blackness meant and what blackness had to do in order to be legitimate. It was out of this idea that I was trying to legitimize my, my ability to say something that counted. And I think that, that that was very damaging. There was a way in which I had to heal that. And I think that I didn't really understand that until probably to graduate coming out of Cambridge was probably when I had the the real breaking point of like, yo, this is this is a lot bigger than um than 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 just developing yourself. This is a lot bigger than that. These conversations are they run a lot deeper. And it is not just whether or not you are right. Because I always thought if you had if you were right then the power would be a key. Again, a misunderstanding of history, a misunderstanding of how we even had the Voting Rights Act occur and things of that sort, thinking that what you really had was these kind of dialogues going on and put folks going, oh my God, I didn't know that was happening. Let's fix it, right? And that kind of misperception, I think, creates a lot of um, losses of opportunities to have power, to truly have power. And to understand what it means to have power around interpreting your own experience, interpreting the world around you, um, being um, interpreting yourself, those kinds of things are things that I came late to the table with because I really misunderstood the history and, and the context of what it meant to be black. Mm. I, that, that's but, go ahead. Can, can I just ask, are you saying that in that concept, in, in that period, that essentially those who had power had so much power over you that that whatever you thought you could do in order to increase your power was not going to work. What I'm saying is a miseducation, right? It's a miseducation in terms of like how society ascribes like meaning to what is actually happening, but is not actually happening. It's like it's. It, it, but yeah, it, is, it does it have to do with education, this sort of indoctrination of like of our sort of imagination and our and our beliefs. Yeah. And I mean, I think that when the, the indoctrination piece is a really important one there, because there's a distortion, the distortion of history distorts your understanding of your location in, the, in, in this context. It distorts your understanding of, of, of what you are doing, of what needs to be done. And I think that we see that like. This, this idea, when, when you come out of the civil rights movement, right, that entire generation, you see that pervasive kind of um, desire to, to fit in, to move into white society, to, to somehow ingratiate oneself to white society, to believe that even now we hear these narratives, I hear it from my parents all the time, where it's this idea that they could somehow um, protect their children, right? Like, oh, if you don't, if you don't wear that hoodie, then you're not going to be in danger. If you make sure that um, you go to school, then you will be seen as someone who's productive. It's all of these kind of misdirections around what will fully humanize, what will fully empower you, when in fact what's fully going to empower you is the system naming for itself that there is a problem here that is at scale and much larger than, than us, that the creation of Blackness itself is, a, is, is intentionally a creation of a lack of power. And if you did not have that lack of power, you wouldn't have the oversupply of power for whiteness. I think when you don't understand that, the way that you move is in this idea that you think you're going to receive this power, that you think you're going to um, take this power. And I think I'm now in the space of trying to um, reconceptualize what it means to have, to, to have power. What does it mean to have power over myself, to have power over my understanding of the narrative? have power we're moving forward into that story. That's yeah, that's incredibly powerful. And I want to hear Judith's thoughts in a second. I think like for me, like I always see like at least 
moving to the U.S., growing up Black in America, I, I think a lot of my conception of power has always been like a, a very negative one. It's like anytime I hear power, it's like it's like uh, someone is doing bad. It's like it's it's almost almost as if like 90 percent of whenever power is discussed in, in culture or in narratives or in the mainstream, it seems like it's like a there is a system, there's an, a, a people that is that is affecting power over an other group of people. And, 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 I, and I'm wondering why also in my imagination, I'm just kind of thinking right now is like, why is power, when I think of like a positive form of power, why is power so singular? Like, why is it sort of, why does it embrace so much the individual, not, not the collective, not the community, not the be- people coming together to affect change. And it's like, is that by design? Is that, is that by design that, the meaning structures of how power has been sort of conceived and studied or expressed in our society is always like, okay, there's this group of people that is oppressing this other group of people. And it's like, but I, I, it seems like I don't get to, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not connecting to different media pieces, but I don't hear a lot of stories of like people claiming their sort of power and like radically like going after and changing but like can can that be a collective thing um but I, I would love to hear your your thoughts around like the idea like how wh- what does that process look like when you start to kind of claim your power because i know sometimes for me when i think about like do i have power as a male and and it seems like and I think it was a conversation we had at Central Park, Judith, a little bit was around the idea that like power doesn't have to be bad. It's like for me, it's like, how do I claim power in this stage of my life without sort of like having that state of power where it's not something that's like being abused, but it's something that it's my right. It's it's a sort of universal right that I can exist, that I can can sort of navigate spaces that I can create, that I have a a level of genius that is needed in society today. And I feel so much of the time, like that radical confidence is, is as a form of power is like, how do you root that in the heart? How do you root that in the body? How do you root that with sort of the right conception of your ancestry? Because it's like, there's so much there's so much imbued in this sort of becoming, because I think it's, I feel like you need a level of power to fully imagine new possible futures. If like, if our systems are completely been designed to kind of keep people into boxes and like make the levers of change very slow to the point that it kind of like creates oppression, like, there, those are a lot of different things I'm I'm wrestling with, and I would love to hear sort of your thoughts around that too. Hmm. Well, then, you know what you're saying is just you know prompts so many different things. Um, <laughs> you know, again, going back to um, the sense of uh, of being Jewish, uh, that often means being though it's conceived just the opposite. Uh, Jews are perceived to be all-powerful and, you know, to wealthy and uh, essentially uh, running the world. That, that, as we know, is not the case. And if that uh, sentiment becomes strong enough, then the society will try to wipe out the population which is precisely what happened in, in Europe and uh, you know the devastation of it. Uh, out of that, then you have this founding of, of Israel where Jews simply say, we can't live, we can't depend upon having sufficient a power to, and independence and respect them or whatever or opportunity we can't do it in other countries we can only do it in our own country and so at the same time american jury is getting stronger and stronger and feels that the democracy empowers 
the rule of law and civility and um, opportunity. And it did it for immigrants, but it did not do it for blacks. That's it. Now, you speak about, you know, the power of, of to some extent of history. One of the horrible things that's happening is that the capacity to break the American narrative, which is excludes Blacks, refuses to recognize the humanity and the unbelievable uh, endurance and accomplishments of the Black population. That narrative is being fought over. That was power. You said this was a white country. It des Whites deserved to pillage and destroy and enslave and then oppress. Um, that's the narrative. And we did it, and we did it essentially by excluding Blacks from history. Excluding. Failing to, to recognize the cost and the failure to recognize that the implementation of power for some was at the expense, the horrible expense of others. Uh, and you use all sorts of different concepts to do it. For example, that uh, Blacks are an inferior race, scientifically. I mean, you know, not just uh, culturally, scientifically, they are inferior. Brains are smaller. They're not capable of thinking. Uh, you know, and we can we can trace this. Um, so, you know, history is the to to do history well and to do it right means to uncover the massive distortions in it. Uh, but but then when you speak about power, I would I just pulled out this uh, um, poem, the Langston Hughes poem, which uh, Carol Anderson is so deeply committed to. Um, and, you know, the, the, the poem, I Too. Um, and it is this blend of powerlessness with power. And the power is to imagine that things will change. And in fact, to demand that they change. That's a form of power. Even though, as Carol has talked about it, our perceptions of how that can be done are often faulty and and often don't don't help us in improve. I, and again, if I can go back to, for example, to Israel, what it's going through today is this unbelievable power struggle between the religious and the theocratic and the people who think that it must be living, you know, according to religious law versus a much more emancipated and secular and more broad thinking world. These two are in profound conflict. In America, you have exactly the same conflict between the evangelicals, who are the ones who are so embedded in the narrative of white supremacy and that this is a Christian nation. And, you know, when they say it's a Christian nation, it's dangerous for everybody because it's a, they use their concept of Christianity to dominate and to restrict the, the independence and the beliefs of others. But but the Carol, but I just want to you know read it because you know it. But but again, uh, there is woven into the sense of powerlessness also the seeds of power to overcome it. Uh, so you know, I too sing America. So it's America. Amer so where's the power? It's in America. I'm the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. So right there, he's saying, I've got power. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. 
Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and they'll be ashamed. I too am America. So, yeah. So, then you can say, that's a crock of shit. You can say it. But if you do, then I think you deprive yourself of power. Because what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to hold others responsible to make sure that we can make our way. And it has to be a combination of the two. I I love that. I, I appreciate you reading Langston Yu's uh, poem. I'll put it in the show notes after. I I would love to hear Caroline's uh, and thoughts as well because I'm wondering like I I really like what you're saying, Judith, in terms of like powerlessness and power. They're they're sort of inextricably tied. It's like it's almost as if it's like it's almost as if the cup gets filled and you have to empty the cup, no matter what it is. And it's almost, there's almost a spiritual di dimension to it too, of like, how do I claim? It's like, it's almost as if it's like power has almost seeks to exist in the material. And when it becomes so material, it becomes so ego. And then when it becomes so ego, it separates itself from the whole, but it's like, that's the point where it's like, there's a balance you have to kind of bring it back to the source bring it back to the core like i'm wondering like caroline what has been your process you you alluded a little bit earlier of like you've you've been back in the south now like how have you started to sort of reshape or even reclaim in a more embodied form of power is there powerlessness in it is there is there what what are the dimensions of that power that you feel right now yeah, that's a great question. And I totally agree uh, with both you and Judy. I think that powerlessness is, it is, it is, um, it's not just that it's a part of power, it's that it is a part of, of existence. You know, you are going to be powerless. That is the reality of anything. There, there is nothing that is, uh, that is living and breathing on this planet that is infinitely powerful. And so I think that there is a certain frailty that we have to be able to accept about our own power no matter what. Even if this was a fully equal society, there would be a powerlessness that has to exist so that the whole can function. That is necessary. So I think that one of the things that has been important to me is to look at the places in which I am. If I, if I play around with the word power and I think about some of the other dynamics that come up for me, power is so well attached to responsibility. It's so well attached to that, right? When I think about that, then my life is now pregnant with all of these opportunities for ways in which I can be powerful. I think one of the ways that has been amazing for me is to learn more about what is exactly happening and how we got here. Because in that way, it, it allows me to understand my entire lineage, like my entire processing of arriving at this point. It allowed me to understand the, the, the dynamic, dynamic of conversations that I'm even having with people. Where are they getting these ideas from? Where do these ideas source from? Those kinds of things, right? You, you can get that when you begin to lean in and learn a little bit more about how we are here and what is actually happening. But I also think that there is a way in which I am leading to, and I think that it, I think that a lot of us are going to need to, to begin to create a lens for ourselves. To look at the world. I think that the white supremacist, white supremacist and colonial lens is one that is just broken. There is just, it is irreparably broken. And there are ways in which we have to begin to redefine and reclaim what words mean. Even. What does it mean to have power? What does it mean to be a servant? What does it mean to love? What does it mean truth, justice, things of that nature? We have to redefine those things because the colonial lens has defined us defined for us, and this is what we have. This is the product that we have from that. And so I think that there is a way in which, when you begin to take control over the mental construct that you have, the way that you're doing the world, that is, to me, all powerful. I think that if you're going to look at a shift in society, it's going to start from people beginning to shift internally in the ways in which they relate to the state, in the ways in which they will allow the state to relate to themselves, in the ways in which they give credibility, to a state that in many ways is not credible, 
these are the ways in which we are able to take claim over that which we have responsibility over, which is what's going on today. Like that is what we have responsibility over. And until we begin to do those things, until we begin to give ourselves license to redefine these things and to create a new lens that is incredibly new, I think in many ways we're going to end up still in this dynamic, right? Like, and I think as I heard, I love that length of news poem. I love it. And it, it it's funny because when you when you started reading it, I had this like voice come up in, in me that was like, do I care to be American? <laughs> Do I care to be American? And like, that's a really important voice to listen to because there is a complication in that. There is a power in that even that, that the United States has over me. If I need to claim to it that I'm American, I, I am not here by nature of, of, of having existed naturally in this environment. I am I'm African. I'm supposed to be on that, on that continent. So in reality, my relationship with America has to be one that that I have to I have to really dig into. I have to give some meat to that. I have to give some sustenance to that and be able to define who I am in this nation and be able to define what my relationship is with this nation and not allow the nation to define for me who I am, not allow the nation to give me or not give me access to being called American. And so I think I'm 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 in this place where I'm allowing myself to get messy and to start to deal with a lot of these these linguistic pieces, a lot of these pieces of ideas that I had around what it meant to be powerful, what it meant to be useful, what it, all of those things, right? Even if we think about power, when we think about power in the colonial uh, construct, I think that we think about power in the sense of things that history would define as power. We, if history wrote it down as power, then we define it as power. If, if the system says that you are powerful, then you are powerful. But in that, in that way, I think that it really cages us from being able to implement power in different ways. It cages us from being able to feel as though if we are raising our families in different ways, we are powerful. If we are creating um, different schooling systems, we are powerful. There are these ways in which I believe that we have to begin to articulate um, our own power around things that are around us, even. We have to be able to redefine those things. And that necessarily means moving away from the lens that we were given and finding a lens that is naturally ours. I, wow. I, Judy, I want to say one small comment real quick in response, because yeah. I, I, one of the writers I really enjoy is Jacques Derrida. He was like a post-structuralist. He studied like symbols and semiotics and he, he he's famous and his words, he says like, there's nothing outside the word. Like everything, you cannot imagine anything outside the world, like from the sky, from the car, from the your, your chair, from what you're hearing, like words are there. And I didn't really understand it until I was listening to something by Maya Angelou and Maya Angelou was saying like how she carries the words all over her body, like mm -hmm. how like words have are real things and like her hair, her her dress, even her history, even the poetry, like words travel across time and have so much power so i feel like in kind of narrowing down what you're seeing around the idea of being american what does american mean and it's like i think i i think i am also like i i had to claim that identity for myself almost decolonize that identity not the sort of like okay the textbook okay we've accomplished this we were this great nation where did that no it's like what does it mean for me and what is that struggle and I feel like, and, and I'm looking at the time, I, I, I'm wondering, and I want to hear what you had to respond to Judith or your question you had, is that that process of discerning, of, of like, like mapping out the words that we carry, that history has imbued or injected in us, like un, unraveling that, that expensive imagination, like, like, how do we start to imagine something, new possibilities outside of the words of history or and, and kind of wrestle? And it's like, is power always in a perpetual struggle? Does it always have to be in a struggle? <laughs> like the struggle of powerlessness, power? Like, I seem like I, and throughout the conversation, I'm hearing like power seems to exist or become or or grow expands in a struggle, a struggle of 
of of or struggle of lack or struggle of possibility or struggle of of dogma like yeah so i i'll leave it at that to to hear any responses and on the questions well i think one is we have to accept the fact that human beings as individuals and as societies as they form societies are immensely complex and there is as we know potential for good and there's enormous potential for bad and and for bad things for thinking and doing bad things that there is a constant competition for who is able to use the resources of a society who is able to use the economic and political and cultural resources uh, and, and and we don't know how to stop ourselves from fighting these battles and they're they're deep and in fact right today at least in this country and not since I think not since the Civil War have we seen uh, a fight uh, that has the potential to destroy the country once again uh, and, a, and a fight either fight for sustaining values however illegitimate illegitimately they were that they 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 were presented and they were lived however hypocritical however toxic toxic they were they also had the potential to make people believe and to expect and to demand that these better things serve the population I mean, the first line here, I too sing America, that is a claim. That is power. That is I too in relationship to you. You're going to make room for me, baby. I'm going to be there. And what am I going to do? I'm going to praise America, because America is going to live up to what it has said it was going to give us and has never done. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, the, this first line is a line of the assertion of power. And 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 when he says, "I too, I too," sing, uh, he is saying. Uh, it's, 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 the language is so simple, but it's so incredibly wonderful. He isn't saying, I to write about America. Uh, he's saying, I to sing. I sing America. I don't sing about America. I sing America. That is, the language itself is, is, is claiming power. Do you, this is a, a response. Do you feel that, because I, I know like a lot in terms of the African-American sort of culture and belief, there's a lot of people that it's like, it's kind of the perpetual struggle between Malcolm X and, and, and. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Like, is it also an act of power to, to deny this sort of vision of America that, Ooh. that yeah. has been like we said, as we sort of has a warp reality and like the majority of people kind of believe this warp reality. Um, like, is that a form of power or is is that something that condemns people? Because I feel like for me, like as a black person, maybe Caroline, you could resonate with that too. I, I it, it seems like I discovered myself more when I started to realize how antagonistic like a lot of the sort of structures and the forces and the no. places seeks to sort of put boxes. It seeks to put these words and like frame it. So it's like, and I understand, I know America is a democratic experiment and it needs to grow and it needs to evolve. And the process of change is so like, it's so messy 
So I, I'm 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 wondering. This is perhaps the final thoughts in terms of like how how do we imagine when so much so much so is wrong. happening, so much other so, so much is wrong, huh? I mean, when when so much is wrong, <laughs> yeah. How do we imagine? And and how many generations do we do we in, in, inveigle in this idea that America is going to live up to its promise? Like how many generations do we inveigle in that? Because when I was a kid and I read that poem, and I'm talking about high school, I remember the feeling of of liberation and pride and the feeling of like, I can't believe it, you know, obviously. But I think that upon greater study, I'm not necessarily convinced that the United States, America, or the Western world in general is going to give the marginalized people of the world, um, including Black bodies in this nation and beyond, um, the promise. Uh, whatever it, it, it was supposed to promise, because even that is debatable itself in terms of what that language meant. Um, and so I think that there is a power, I believe, as well, in deciding that America is not going to give that to us. So what do we do in the wake of that? Okay. What do we do in the wake of, uh, of this world in which we say, okay, well, this is the context that we're in. We're in a white supremacist superstructure. Um, what does it mean to define blackness um, with a capital B? outside of that, because obviously blackness was defined by the white supremacist superstructure. So what does it mean to define liberation outside of those things? I think that we have to begin to, and that's what I mean when I say like decolonizing genuinely, even the language that we're dealing with here. Because I, when we look at, I, this is a, a final thought, I want to just share this, this thing that I read that I thought was so fascinating. I was reading some um, studies and they were talking about how genetically, um, when they look at black people, what they see is the trauma from all of these previous lineages and it has actually shaped our DNA. Now, I think that that is fascinating when you look at that on a larger kind of population level. And what it says to me is that we are not dealing with something that is toxic in theory, we're dealing with something that is toxic to our very nature, the very nature of the organism itself is, is white supremacy, is all of this. And so when I think about this next generation, I would not want to send them into this with the idea that they are going to um, argue their way into equality. I don't think that they're going to argue their way into equality. I don't think they're going to argue their way into liberation. I don't think that that's going to happen because I think that when you're dealing with a concept that has decided actively, it doesn't want to deal with that history. I'm not going to talk about that. In fact, now we're seeing all these laws going on where you can it, you can legitimately write me out of history. I think what you're dealing with here is a context in which I don't know that there is very much hope around this idea that America's going to, to, to restore on that promise. And I think that the greater power is around defining futures that, that exist outside of that paradigm. And that is a way to me where you take away power from the state. That is a way in which you take that power and you put it back where it rightfully belongs, which is within yourself. And I think that we have to begin to look at those things. Incredibly powerful. I think I'll say this. I think I am extremely cognizant of the global sort of paradigm as well. It's like there are nations and spaces and countries that are facing like a lot of different actions. And I feel like I always when I think about the American projects within the context of that international sort of space, it it definitely I can hear I can hear I can already see like the criticism of people say okay no we've achieved this like we we are sort of the levers of truth and justice for a lot of nations look we I can walk out the street and my legs not gonna get blown off like so like wrestling with the paradigm that we do have the privilege to have this conversation where others might not have that conversation but still have the power to push and imagine and create new structures within this experiment. I think, I feel like it's something that's not spoken enough because oftentimes they try to fit everyone in into a sort of a broken paradigm that we know we're like, try, we're trying to hottest year in the entire history of humanity. Oh, that's hundred thousand years, New York Times article this year. And it's just been getting hotter and hotter and hotter every year. And I'm people are like, what's happening? We know exactly what's happening. <laughs> created a, a model of a think in terms of the model not being sustainable. I, I do feel like I agree with Caroline. I also agree with you, Judith. It's like 
we have to claim the imagine the power of imagining things or the possible but i think we can't do that until we claim the words we decolonize like that sort of precious thing or even we decolonize history we have a right understanding of how history has impact on our on our sort of behaviors but i would love to just hear your thoughts about what, what is that one idea that you would take away or you would tell everyone out of this conversation of power um the future in our society carol <laughs> Judy, I'm so anxious to hear what you're thinking. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what are you thinking? Yeah, um, I'm thinking too. <laughs> you know, I'm disappointed that you pushed that off. Um, I, I would say the thing that I would want people to take away is that um, is that these types of discussions are essential, and so legitimize. Legitimize your own power by engaging in conversations around how you can reimagine yourself in this larger social structure and how you can reimagine the world in this larger social structure. That time is not wasted. It is necessary. There is no action that occurs before the mind conceptualizes it. Thank you. And Judith, for the final thoughts. So I was thinking, and this is maybe not a, a very good final thought, when you speak about the, the term decolonization, in a sense, historically, that's 400, 500, 600 years. If you're Jewish, if you're Jewish, then you have been feeling as though you are trying to be accepted for thousands of years and failing. And so... That's a burden, but it's also a promise because the, 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 the vibrancy of those who adhere to being Jewish is in the concept that the work is difficult and there's much that goes wrong, but the responsibility is to make it better in a universal context not just for one people, but for everyone. And so how we work that out, how we work, how we undo the unbelievable travesties of the last four or 500 years, which are burning us up from within and without. How do we do that? But also how to somehow marshal the wisdom of thousands of years of human beings grappling with injustice and with the expectation uh, and expressed through major religions, all of them, that somehow human beings can achieve stability and decency, even though there's much to point to the fact that we are not very good at it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to you both. This is, have been absolutely amazing.